Despite freezing or near freezing conditions, the polar regions boast some of the world's most productive waters. During the summer, the sun is 24 hours in duration, so you get tremendous production in the water column. Uh, phytoplankton blooms, and the seas are just teeming with life. They're just rich. Whereas in tropical seas, it's pretty much barren, almost um, devoid, sterile sea. In the polar regions, the light is such a dominant factor in the availability of light that the season is, is fairly narrow in, in terms of when this productivity occurs. And we have very large phytoplankton blooms in and around the large receding ice edge as the ice is melting in the summer. Those are very active biological zones. You see lots of seals there, lots of whales, lots of uh, zooplankton, and all of the food chain that, that lives on the bloom of phytoplankton when it occurs in the spring, early summer time frame in the polar regions. While the elevated productivity in the polar regions can be explained in part by the nearly full-time presence of light during six months out of every year, there are also other factors at work. In terms of the, the productivity in comparing equatorial regions and polar regions, we are not seeing as much of the nutrient-rich dense water being brought to the surface in equatorial regions as we are in polar regions. It's difficult uh, because of circulation patterns to get as much of this nutrient-rich fertilized water, if you will, into the sunlit shallow areas of the world's oceans where the phytoplankton can benefit and bloom. In the world's polar regions, particularly in the Southern Ocean, upwelling is the standard of the day, and it is why the Antarctic region is so rich productivity-wise, uh, why there's so much krill, why there can be so many salps, why so many whales swim down there to spawn. There's just so much food available for the entire food web to take advantage of. Due to the upwelling and due to the incredible amount of mixing, cold, fertilized, deep water, being brought to the surface through the process of upwelling and some other processes. The polar regions can't compete with tropical reefs in terms of species diversity, but they do provide a home to a broad range of animals which have managed to not only survive, but flourish in conditions that are frequently harsh and unyielding. If you swim in tropical regions, you have coral reefs, you have an enormous biological diversity of plant life and fish life. When you go to the polar regions, it's, the diversity is there, but it's, it's a lot more subtle. When you think about fish, a lot of people think about coral reefs and the beautiful colored fish out there, but fish live everywhere. For instance, there are fish that live in the Antarctic and in the Arctic waters, and they've adapted for their cold environments, and the way they do that is they actually put a form of ethylene glycol into their blood, antifreeze. The same as we put into our cars, they've got in their bloodstreams, and that keeps their blood from freezing up in these extremely cold environments. But extreme temperature is not the only challenge confronting polar organisms. A very interesting question about the seasonality of the polar regions is, if light is not there for, say, six months of the year, what happens to life? Well, obviously photosynthesis can't proceed without light, and, and then all the, the organisms that would live on these uh, plant forms would be faced with potentially starvation conditions. The animals have different strategies for dealing with the lack of food during the winter months. Some animals simply migrate away. So a lot of the larger animals that can swim fairly fast, the marine mammals, some of the larger birds, just swim up to another area and they make a living. There's not as much food in that area, but there's enough for them to keep going through the winter months. Other organisms just tough it out. They're adapted to deal with a very seasonal, high seasonal variability in the amount of food that's available. And so they either go into hibernation or some parallel of hibernation where they just simply do not feed during the winter months and they have very low metabolic rates and they're just sticking it out until the summer comes again and all that food comes in and they eat like crazy and they reproduce like crazy and then they basically just go back to sleep. Well, let's take the famous example of Antarctic krill. Uh, it is felt that they are able to winter over by taking in large amounts of food when food is available and storing it as lipids and so forth. And then there's some debate as to how they actually regulate their metabolism and where they actually live under ice flows during this period. But the sense is that they can just basically go through a winter over, almost starvation condition, for many months pending the next bloom. Whether attempting to mitigate environmental problems or conduct other forms of research, 
Scientists working in the polar regions face a host of challenges. Typically, it's easier for us to work in polar regions during the summer months because there's more light, uh, because you can see more things. Physiologically, we do better when we get more sunlight, when we're deprived of that sunlight. Uh, depression can happen to certain people. More, some people are more prone to that sort of a thing than others. Um, we work in polar regions year-round. We're involved with projects right now where we're trying to understand more about how krill survive the winter in Antarctica, in a region called Marguerite Bay regions of which are below the Antarctic Circle. So this time of the year or in the summer, uh, what we're seeing is 24 hours of darkness. We're seeing a lot of ice cover. You're working hard when you're at sea, whenever you're at sea. But when you're in the polar regions and you're in the ice, the crunching, the cold, the dark, all contributes uh, to a greater challenge than we normally experience in other parts of the world's oceans. The challenges, while formidable in all polar regions, are more daunting in some than in others. Antarctica is a continent surrounded by ocean. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. And so the Arctic is in some ways harder to penetrate. You're on open ice fields. You can't fly in and land in, with helicopters and planes. And so you need the icebreakers to penetrate up to the North Pole. And we can skip some of these problems in the Antarctic because we can fly over the ice pack and land on um, glaciers. Along with differences in geography, there are a number of other factors that distinguish the Arctic region from Antarctica. For example, extensive nutrient upwelling in the Southern Ocean drives productivity to much higher levels than in the Arctic. And there are very distinct animal species present as well as absent in each region. But as real as they are, these differences don't compare in scope to the extreme contrast between the tropical seas and the poles. In nearly every way imaginable, from availability of light to temperature, from productivity and circulation patterns to biology, these are vastly different regions, so much so that it scarcely seems possible that they could occupy the same planet. And while the distinctions between them may not be quite as severe as, for example, the differences between Mercury and Jupiter, they represent extremes that, at least here on planet Earth, are unparalleled.